Apostrophe Podcast Network. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. Go ahead and do this. Google Terry O'Reilly. If you do, invariably what will pop up first is a famous hockey player for the Boston Bruins. A Canadian, of course, because, well, all great hockey players are born in Canada. But I digress. Because I'm not talking about the six foot one, 200 pound ice bruiser and captain of the Boston team. I'm talking about another giant. A giant in the world of marketing and more specifically, advertising. Throughout my life, I have gravitated towards great storytellers, be it songwriters or radio hosts or filmmakers. I love a great storyteller. There are only a few who are utterly amazing and compelling, and Terry O'Reilly, the radio host, not the hockey player, is right up there at the top of the list. For years, he has hosted radio shows for CBC in Canada, such as O'Reilly on Advertising, Age of Persuasion, and currently his podcast, Under the Influence, which has hit over 50 million downloads. And why? Because of Terry's brilliant storytelling, all backed up by an insane amount of research. What he has to tell you about advertising will absolutely have touched a part of your own life sometime, somehow, and often profoundly. This is a five-part interview, because when Terry and I get talking, aided by just a touch of fine scotch, we are not going to stop for some time. So I've split it up into five segments, where we meander through a series of compelling subject matters. In this part three of my interview with Terry O'Reilly, he digs into the pitch meeting, and what it takes to make the deal happen, and the shifts and changes that have happened in the advertising industry throughout the years. To set the stage, we were sitting on my deck with a roaring outside fire. In case you're wondering what all that crackling is, with the sun setting on a small Ontario lake. These are the words of Terry O'Reilly. So you're working 12 hours a day. You're, you're making $8,500 a year full time. And you're having to, to pump out radio spots because you've got sales guys that want it on the air. You've got antsy clients. And you're, you don't have any time to polish anything. This is the true north, wild and free. There's no better place. Can be eagles soaring over mountains high, Arctic circles, open sky. When us young writers in the 80s, us green young copywriters, saw Letterman and saw the irony at work there and how he and the audience were in on the joke, but the guest wasn't, like that whole thing that he used to do, it changed the way we we wrote our, our ads. Canadian Red and white, blue and blue. I am Canadian just like you. Yeah. They say the great definition of an introvert is someone that when they recharge, they recharge alone. An extrovert can only recharge by being around a lot of people. Interesting. So by that definition, I am 100% an introvert. Uh, Not to cop out, I'm probably a hybrid. You know, I don't think I'm one or the other. Uh, I definitely recharge alone. Tends to be with my partner in life. Yeah, and me too. Right. So that's important recharging for me. I'm a situation-specific extrovert. Really? But I am an introvert at heart. Well, or are you a performer? Are you a polished performer more than an extrovert? Well, I mean, that's probably another another way to put it, that I can perform when necessary, but it's not that what I live for. Hmm. And it's not, like I say, I, I would, you know, even even when I'm driving to a, to give a keynote, I could easily turn around and go home, <laughs> <laughs> even if you really got right down to it, because I'm really at heart an introvert, which is funny because I host a national radio show and I give keynote talks. If you If you looked at my life from the outside, you think he's an incredible extrovert. And I'm not. No, no, I, I know you well enough to yeah. know that. You put yourself where? On that spectrum. A hybrid. But what I love, I, I mean, honestly, Terry, I grew up loving 
I wanted to be a song and dance man. I love and respect performance and great performers. Always have as a musician. When I perform, I'll, I'll pick my musicians that play with me on stage based on how are they on stage. Now, they might be completely like Miles Davis. That's okay if that's your shtick and you right. do and you pull it off well. But if you're just boring, that's just boring. Right. I love performance and I love presenting. And that's why I put performance into my presenting, even if I'm teaching survival skills. There's, there's something very special about holding someone's attention. And maybe that's part and parcel with being an advertising person. You're holding someone's attention and they're not giving you, it's not like they've gone to a watch you in a theater like they no. would a play. You're interrupting them. So that, that's the key to advertising and as an advertising writer that you have to keep in mind because that's the very insightful thing you just said. All advertising is an intrusion on what people are really there to see or hear or listen to. It's not like they put on a, a Les Stroud CD because they want to hear Les Stroud. I'm kicking the door open to bring a message in the middle of the television show that you're glued to. So in order to pull that off, in order to make that intrusion the most rewarding or most polite, you had to bring something else to the selling message. So that's why I specialized in humor. I was the humor writer and I became the humor director. If you had a comedy script, you would come to pirate radio and you would hire me because I believe that humor is the great shock absorber of life. And that if you could wrap a, a selling message around a really smart, funny thing, people might might accept the intrusion and remember it. Do you remember the Molson commercials when they'd be at the cottage and they'd drop the case of beer off the dock or, or they'd grab it just in the last... Do, do you remember those Molson yeah, commercials? Yeah, yeah. They were very funny. Very funny. Very f Molson had a great history. Molson Golden. I don't remember that brand. <laughs> Molson really Golden. Really funny commercials. That was the beer of my father. It was Molson was Golden. It? Yeah. And, in the, and the beer of our teenage years was Molson Export. Where you were in Sudbury, you drank Ex blue, didn't you? No, no, no. Export. We would, we would order it like yeah, this, yeah, right? But, With the cross fingers. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yep. They were, uh, they were brilliant. I, I want to ask a fairly kind of nebulous question, but hmm. when did the art of advertising become as powerful and as important as it is now. The 30s, the 80s, when it seems to be something other than what it was in 1920. So when did it, when did that happen? 1920 was actually the biggest decade for advertising. Yeah. Huh. All the big advertising agencies that started in the 20th century and that still exist today all started in the 20s. There was a lot of money in the 20s until the stock market crashed. Like you look at all the CP hotels and like all those big, beautiful Chateau Lauriers, all the, you know, in this country, they were all built in the 20s, right? There was a lot of money in the 20s. Branding began in the 20s with the railways coming through towns when you could suddenly ship your goods to another town on a railway rather than just buying whatever the, the local, you know, artisans or local farmers would sell. Suddenly, if you could ship your goods to another city, you had to brand them. So... The 1920s was the big, it was really ground zero of the marketing world. Madison Avenue really began in the 20s. I would say, if you're asking me when it really clicked, I would say with television, radio a little bit, but with television in the mid 50s. That's where it really became this, this huge, powerful, big, monolithic industry once the war effort had ended. I'm thinking of something that's going on right now, certainly with podcasting. You and I have had this discussion. It's the return of Lucky Strike presents Frank Sinatra. Yeah. I have to say, it doesn't bother me. To me, I actually go, you, you would think I'd be a purist about it and go, oh, I don't want to be presented by, you know, such and such a corporation. But in fact, I actually see it as like, why not? I mean, look, something that's been missed, and Mike Klink and I speak about this a lot, something that is missing terrifyingly right now for artists everywhere is the ability to make a living off your art. Right. Uh, George Strombo talked about that and he made a great point about the same people who were bitching and complaining that Bono put a, a free download right. of, of U2 in there with their Apple thing are the same people who were stealing music through Napster just, just before that, you know, and not paying artists for their work. So this whole new thing, uh, I just, there's a Freudian slip, this whole new thing of corporations making sure you can present your art. I'm dealing with it right now on particular production work I'm doing, including my podcast yep. with Aggressor Adventures who yep. came on board to say, we'll help you do this less. But you're right. In the fifties, that's when it was, the groundwork was laid. Yeah. Oh, without question. Without yeah. question. Because television was new. 
you know, whenever a new medium arrives, it borrows from the previous medium until it finds its footing. So television really borrowed big time from radio, where it was, you know, the Texaco Jack Benny hour, you know, those kind of things. And that spilled into television for many, many years until Sigourney Weaver's father, Pat Weaver, changed that whole industry, where instead of one advertiser advertising one show, he figured out in his mind very quickly that if you sold multiple spots to multiple advertisers, instead of charging $10,000 to sponsor a television show and picking a number out of the air, why not charge 10 sponsors $3,000 each and make $30,000 out of it? You so mean that, Pat Weaver is to blame for all of this? Yeah. He created the, the phenomenon of multiple advertisers in broadcast shows. Because prior to that, it was one advertiser attached to a show. I kind of miss that. I'm kind of glad to see it return. Podcasting is really like old time radio, isn't it? It really can be. Well, yeah. and, and why not? Yeah. But even the way it's sponsored, it feels like the golden age of radio. Yeah. With the exception of, I end up finding myself reading and writing copy for some company for not the kind of money that I could have been paid, you know, if they'd come on board as a major sponsor yeah. or, or, or funding sort of yeah. thing. Sort of, yeah. sort of thing. I've been dancing my way around the, the, um, the PBS model in the United States because of my Wild Harvest series. And I won't diss it at all. Uh, I'm really proud to have my, that American Public Television put Wild Harvest on air on PBS stations. But it's been, that's an even different kind of funding because it's, you know, owned by the public. So you that's have to right. be very careful. Yeah, pledging and, yeah. Yeah, when the FCC rules, you know, whether or not a, logo shows up yeah and then we have the alternate swing the pendulum over to fishing shows where it's nothing but logos screaming at you through, <laughs> right. you know it sort of takes pat weaver's model and turns it you know times 20 yeah it's almost like the 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 outfits that the f1 drivers wear, right? and NASCAR it's just logos and, yeah. <laughs> top to the bottom right? will ferrell yeah. and, and talladega yeah. nights yeah, yeah right. but then this brings me right smack back to my original question about why there's so much bad advertising and i asked you this before i want to go there's another genre of bad advertising you tell me so many great stories about great advertising in your series yeah. in, in under the influence i don't need to go there but the bad examples for me local radio i think is the bottom of the barrel notched only a little bit above them might be local television why terry why is local radio and tv so insulting to the intelligence i started my career in local radio so the very first job i got out of ryerson was at a little radio station in burlington called fm 108 it was the first 50s and 60s radio station in Canada because oldies were just becoming oldies in 1980. I'll tell you the reality of working in a, ra a small town radio station is you are all alone as a writer. I had no other writers with me. I had to produce all the work that I wrote. And the contracts from the sales guys are coming in a million miles an hour. I was writing at some days 20, 25 commercials a day and producing them right out of Ryerson I mean, green, didn't know what I was doing, had, was baptism by fire. But my point being the volume at a local radio station is such that you don't get any mentorship. You're kind of left all alone. My first job out of Ryerson as the copywriter at FM 108, the copy chief, if I may, copy chief of one, I made $8,500 a year full time. Mm -hmm. in 1981 not wartime wages less this is mm -hmm. 1981 mm -hmm. so you're working 12 hours a day you're you're making eight thousand five hundred dollars a year full time and you're having to pump out radio spots because you've got sales guys that want it on the air you've got antsy clients and you're you you do not have any time to polish anything and you're learning you know writers at local radio stations are first-time writers and they, That's the yeah. entry-level position. They're hoping to get a job on national radio later. Or to get, like me, aim for the advertising agencies once you've got a couple of miles on your odometer, right? Since Terry is such a legend in the world of advertising, and since he is very much a Canadian, I chose this little ditty to play for today's podcast's music. Performed with my good friends and also good Canadian boys, the Northern Pikes, this was always a song I figured should, maybe someday, be picked up as a theme song at least for a good Canadian beer. From the short album I recorded with the Northern Pikes called Long Walk Home, this is I Am Canadian. This is the true north, wild and free. There's no better place I can be. Eagles soaring over mountains high. Listen to the stories 
And green oceans clear. Life is higher when you're living here. I can whistle down the northern lights and play hockey on a summer's night. Taste the fresh Atlantic spray. Run through fields of prairie hay. Stand by the totems on our BC coast. Listen to the stories of Ontario ghosts. Paddle down a river on a lake up a stream. Hike up a mountain on the valleys in between. Dance in a powwow, dance on a street. Or head to the city where the people like to meet us. I am Canadian. Canadian, how about you? I am Canadian, red and white, blue and blue. I am Canadian, just like you. Canadian. You know what? Aggressor Adventures, while being the largest liveaboard dive operation in the world, is so much more. They have safaris and excursions to the corners of the globe, exciting opportunities to see vast archaeology, history, and natural wonders. I've been traveling and diving with them for years, and I cannot endorse them enough for being simply the best there is at making sure your worldwide adventure is a safe, comfortable, and exciting one. Take it from a guy who has done a lot of adventuring. Who do I travel with on my vacations? Aggressor Adventures. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. Sometimes I still want to push back and go, yeah, but they're so bad. Is, are they really well, that bad? And well, but, they really but even, are. You know? Even in the day when I was doing that, when I was in that world, you would still occasionally see that there was an opportunity in the 12 contracts on your desk that day, that there was an interesting product or an interesting company, and you could polish one or two of those once in a while. And I would do that. I would know which ones to take home and secretly spend a little more time on because I sensed an opportunity there and I could do something creative with it. The other ones I just had to pump out because that was the deal. And you're getting your 14 talking points from the local tire shop owner that he really wants to make sure you say those 14 things. So you, what do you do? You, you, you read those and you're done. That even echoed into the advertising agency world where you're, where you're surrounded by top ad professionals. The briefs, I rarely got a great brief ever. I always say it's 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag. Always. Like they always gave you too much. It should be sell one thing well. And if you've got three things to sell, that's three commercials. That's not three things in one commercial. So that was the other big fight you always had in agency life is trying to get clients to be simple. And my analogy was if I had six apples in my hand and if I threw them at you, you'd probably drop them all. But if I lobbed you one, you could probably catch it. That's advertising. That's communication in the 20th century or 21st century. Why puns? Why do puns exist? Why, why, why are they so prevalent? Well, it's easy, right? Okay. I had a creative director once said uh, puns are grounds for dismissal. So he, <laughs> he, I like that yeah, guy. And he, he was serious about it. Okay. Yeah. And, I like him. Uh, yeah. So I was never a fan of it unless I could turn a pun on its ear hmm. and, or put it in the, in the, the context was so absurd that it, it became funny. That was the only reason I would ever venture there. But I think it's, 
pun is the, you know, they say it's the lowest form of humor. It's easy. It's the low hanging fruit. So I think, why is it? That's why. Well, I'll just tell that to CBC's As It Happens then, and we'll see how where they can go. Oh. I just want to just, I'll just jump through the radio every time. Say, no, don't. Do, oh, here it comes. Yeah. As it happens. Radio. If you can do it with irony, home. it'll work. I mean, Letterman used yeah. to do that all the time. He would just give you the most lame lines, mm-hmm. but they were just dripping with irony that it was funny. Well, right? that's great. That's like Randy Newman, the songwriter. That's that's where is, there's intelligence behind He that. changed advertising, by the way. Randy Newman? No, no, no. David, David Letterman. Letterman. When us young writers in the 80s, us green young copywriters saw Letterman and saw the irony at work there and how he and the audience were in on the joke, but the guest wasn't. Like that whole thing that he used to do, it changed the way we we wrote our, our ads. The generation before us, you know, they w- would do something silly. Like if you use the right underarm deodorant, you'll get ahead in your career. And they were earnest about that that pitch. And we just found that laughable, my generation. So we would do the same thing. Say, if you use this this underarm deodorant, you only get to be president. You'll be CEO. Like, we pushed it so far because it was so absurd to us that we found the humor in it. And that came from the, the era of Letterman. And you don't think, I think Letterman's a talk show host. He affected the advertising industry because of his attitude. That's that really us interesting. young writers in the 80s all just gravitated to. I remember one of my, the second creative director I ever had in the 80s, when I handed in my script, he said, I don't get your humor. He said, your script is like the far side. And I took that as such a compliment that it was like Gary Larson's far side. He meant it as an absolute criticism because it was two eras, two generations butting heads right there. Tell me about, and I remember it well, La Pia <laughs> And for, for listeners who are certainly in, maybe in the States, I don't know, but you, you kind of have to be of, of my generation to know what I just said. So tell me about La Piedor. We had an account at our agency call, uh, that was a um, alcohol account, and one of their brands was a, a wine called La Piedor. And they asked us to write a TV commercial for it. So we came up with what I thought was a really wonderful commercial it was like a a french film with subtitles it was really really interesting and kind of sexy and the client tore it apart we could not this is one of those meetings where we could not convince them to leave it alone they tore out the heart of it changed the copy turned it upside down i was a young green copywriter I, i didn't have enough confidence to really fight for it anyway it ended up being something i didn't even recognize it got approved in that form then it was going to be shot in Paris. And I refused to go less because I stamped on my hanky and stood on my principle saying, I don't believe in this commercial anymore. And I was a green copywriter. I was probably had six months under my belt at this big agency by that point. I said, I'm not going because I don't believe in it. So everybody else went to Paris. They shot the commercial. They had the time of their lives. I'd never even been to Europe by that point. Mm-hmm. They came back with the commercial. They showed it to me and I said, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And I'm, uh, it's exactly what I was afraid of. It's, it's absolutely horrible. So they assembled the commercial, put a soundtrack on it, put it out on the air. And every time that commercial aired less, they sold out of that wine. Ugh. Every time that commercial aired, they couldn't make enough wine to meet the demand that that commercial generated. And that it was an interesting moment for me because nothing about that commercial worked for me. There was no idea. There was nothing memorable about it. There was a beautiful actress in it. She was speaking French. There were subtitles, but it didn't make any sense. But there was something, there was a magical aspect to that. There was something about that commercial that had an X factor to it that people just loved. I couldn't see it. I still can't see it. You can find that commercial on YouTube and I look at it, I occasionally come across it and I think, I still hate this commercial. Yet it was incredibly effective. And here's the funny end beat to that. Many years later, I'm at a restaurant with my wife, Debbie, and the waiter is taking our order and and my wife drinks white wine, I drink red. He said, uh, what kind of wine do you, um, are you looking for? My wife said, what do you have? I like French wine. He said, well, we have Le Piet d'Or. And I rolled my eyes at, the, at just the sound of it. And he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, you don't like the wine? And my wife said, ignore him. He wrote a commercial for that, that wine years ago that he hated. And he looked at me and he goes, 
you wrote the uh, commercial for Lupia Dor, the dry without the edge commercial? I said, yes. He said, I love that commercial. <laughs> I loved that commercial. And I thought, oh my God. So he was all thrilled that, that I had anything to do with it. He goes back into the kitchen, I guess, to give an order to the chef. But five minutes later, my wife goes, she goes very subtly, look around your right shoulder and look back at the kitchen. So I slowly turn and it's a, you know, a, a typical kitchen door with a round window in it. I see the waiter and the chef looking out the window. And I can tell that the waiter is telling the chef that I wrote the La Piedor commercial and he's going, and, and the chef's like, mm. like, cannot believe that the guy that wrote that commercial is in the house. And I hate it. <laughs> I hated that commercial less. And that was like one of the big weird lessons of my life that sometimes there's an X factor in television shows, in movies. Like why is a movie a big hit? And then the sequel with the same staff and same crew and same writer is a dismal failure that there's an X factor that sometimes you have no control over. The X factor. That's an interesting, the X factor has always been intriguing to me because you can't train for it. You can't plan for it. You can't write it. Sometimes it's, you can't even articulate what it is. No, it's either there or it isn't. You know, I was watching a movie last night with my son, Logan. Terrible, terrible older movie. But in that movie, doing a bit part was uh, the comedian, the very heavy obese comedian, John Panette, before he passed away. Every time he was on screen, I couldn't stop looking at him. <laughs> he just had that thing. He just wanted to, he just like, oh, look, he's so funny. You didn't even get, I don't know what else is going on in the scene, but that's John Panette and he makes me laugh. And it's I just, know. There's that X factor, and I guess you're right. I mean, it plays out in more than just a person. It also plays out in a creation. Yeah. Where did you go wrong? Where did you go wrong with Lapia Door? Well, it just violated every belief I have about advertising. It didn't have an idea. I'm an idea guy. I believe that there should always be a, a, a wonderful selling idea attached to the product based on a strategy. It had none of that. It had no storyline. It didn't have a... a an A, B, C, and D. It just it just didn't have any any of the of the earmarks of a good commercial. And yet, and yet, it was one of the biggest successes that I watched. <laughs> I don't feel like anything to do with that. I watched from afar. I mean, literally, less. They had to pull it off the air if they didn't have enough wine ready for people because it was that biggest success. And I just can't to this day articulate what it is. And you know what? Sitting beside you here, I remember it. I can still, I, like, that's why I quoted it. <laughs> that is, uh, there you go. Like, I, I don't know why you would have ever remembered that commercial. Terry has a brand new book out, My Best Mistake. It is a brilliant take on the art of moving on from and making the most out of your biggest slash best mistake. And so ends part three of my chat with Terry O'Reilly. If you like this podcast, check out my interview with the legendary producer Mike Klink, or the rest of this interview. There's two more yet to go when you're under the influence. No, 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 no. That's not quite right. You do it, Terry. When you're under the influence. This podcast is, as the saying used to go, brought to you by Aggressor Adventures. Choose your adventure. Surviving Life with Les Stroud is presented by the Apostrophe Podcast Network and is mixed by Keith Ullman. You're surviving life with me, Les Stroud. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud, as I have hundreds of videos there and more going up every week. From Survivor Man Archive to Bigfoot to Wild Harvesting Tips to Urban Disaster Survival. It's all there and it's all free. My brand new series, Wild Harvest, featuring local foraging and turning those wild edibles into sumptuous dishes, is now on National Geographic Asia, PBS stations in the United States, and Cottage Life Television in Canada. Woohoo! Beautiful little rainbow. Dinner. This perhaps is the most incredible kitchen scenario I've ever had. When you start getting involved in local foraging and bringing the ingredients home and playing with them in the kitchen, can you create a dish where the domestic ingredients don't overshadow the wild ingredients? Up, hey there. Oh! Go on! Now the job's getting fun. This dish is a showcase of how great these forged ingredients come together. It's the best when it's its own flavor. When you're making something with a wild edible, you're nailing it and not losing the wild flavor. Sometimes it is about the ingredients. 
the brand new special Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud is now on a PBS station near you in the United States or on my YouTube channel. What the heck is going on? Oh. It felt apocalyptic. No radio, yeah. no TV. It happened almost instantly. No one was prepared for this. A lot of people just don't think it'll happen to me. It's basic human nature not to want to think about things that will scare us. If you wait until you need to be prepared for something, you're already too late. Anybody want to know what's like during the hurricane? And my brand new children's book, Wild Outside, written for your kids. It's all about getting your kids into the out of doors. And it's out now. Google it. I'm an easy find on Google for those and so much more that I produce during any given year, no matter what's happening on the world stage. We'll figure this life out together. Cue that rip and harmonica solo, Keith. <laughs> 